Part One, Chapter Three A of the Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Reading by Mary Rohde. Part One: The Man in the Case. Chapter Three A: The Mother Load. It was the following evening, and they had dined together again at the St. James Club, Jimmy Dale and Carruthers of the Morning News Argus. From Clayton and a discussion of the Metzer murder, the conversation had turned, not illogically, upon the physiognomy of criminals in general. Jimmy Dale, lazily ensconced now in a lounging chair in one of the club's private library rooms, flicked a minute speck of cigar ash from the sleeve of his dinner jacket, and smiled whimsically across the table at his friend. "'Oh, I dare say there's a lot in physiognomy, Carruthers,' he drawled. "'Never studied the thing, you know, that is, from the standpoint of crime. Personally, I've only got one prejudice. I distrust, on principle, the man who wears a perennial and pompous smirk which isn't, of course, strictly speaking, physiognomy at all. You see, a man can't help his eyes being beady or his nose pronounced, but pomposity and a smirk now, Jimmy Dale shrugged his shoulders. Carruthers laughed, and then glanced ludicrously at Jimmy Dale as the door ajar was pushed open and a man entered. Speaking of angels, murmured Jimmy Dale, and sat up in his chair. Hello, Markle, he observed casually. You've met Carruthers of the new Argus, haven't you? Markle was fat and important. He had beady black eyes, fastidiously trimmed whiskers, and a pronounced smirk. Markle blew his nose vigorously, coughed asthmatically, and held out his hand. Of course, certainly, said he effusively. I've met Carruthers several times, used his sheet more than once to advertise a new bond flotation. The dominant note in Markle's voice was an ingratiating and unpleasant whine, and Carruthers nodded, not very cordially, and shook hands. Markle went back to the door, closed it carefully, and returned to the table. "'Fact is,' he smiled confidentially, "'I saw you two come in here a few minutes ago, and I've got something that I thought Carruthers might be glad to have for his society column, say, in the Sunday edition.' He dove into the inside pocket of his coat, produced a large Morocco leather jeweler's case, and, holding it out over the table between Carruthers and Jimmy Dale, suddenly snapped the cover open, and then, with a complacent little chuckle that terminated in another fit of coughing, spilled the contents on the table under the electric reading lamp. Like a thing of living, pulsing fire it rolled before their eyes. A magnificent diamond necklace, of wondrous beauty, gleaming and scintillating as the light ray shot back from a thousand facets. For a moment both men gazed at it without a word. "'Little surprise for my wife,' volunteered Markle, with a debonair wave of his pudgy hand, and trying to make his voice sound careless. The case lay open, patently displaying the name of the most famous jewelry house in America. Jimmy Dale's eyes fixed on Markle's whiskers, where they were brushed outward in an ornate and fastidious gray-black sweep. "'By Jove!' he commented. "'You don't do things by halves, do you, Markle?' Two hundred and ten thousand dollars I paid for that little bunch of gewgaws, said Markle, waving his hand again. Then he clapped Carruthers heartily on the shoulder. What do you think of it, Carruthers, eh? Say, a photograph of it, and one of Mrs. Markle, eh? Please her, you know. She's crazy on this society stunt. All flubbed up to me, of course. How's it strike you, Carruthers? Carruthers very evidently liked neither the man nor his manners, but Carruthers, above everything else, was a gentleman. "'To be perfectly frank with you, Mr. Markle,' he said a little frigidly, "'I don't believe in this sort of thing. It's all right from a newspaper standpoint, and we do it. But it's just in this way that owners of valuable jewelry lay themselves open to theft.' 
It simply amounts to advising every crook in the country that you have a quarter of a million at his disposal, which he can carry away in his vest pocket, once he can get his hands on it, and you invite him to try. Jimmy Dale laughed. And what Carruthers means, Markle, is that you'll have the gray seal down your street. Carruthers talks of crooks generally, but he thinks in terms of only one. He can't help it. He's been trying so long to catch the chap that it's become an obsession, eh, Carruthers? Carruthers smiled seriously. Perhaps, he admitted. I hope, though, for Mr. Markle's sake, that the gray seal won't take a fancy to it. If he does, Mr. Markle can say good-bye to his necklace. Poof, coughed Markle arrogantly. Overrated. His cleverness is all in the newspaper columns. If he knows what's good for him, he'll know enough to leave this alone. Jimmy Dale was leaning over the table, poking gingerly with the tip of his forefinger at the center stone in the setting, revolving it gently to and fro in the light, a very large stone, whose weight would hardly be less than fifteen carats. Jimmy Dale lowered his head for a closer examination, and to hide a curious, mocking little gleam that crept into his dark eyes. "'Yes, I should say you're right, Markle,' he agreed judicially. "'He ought to know better than to touch this. It would be too hard to dispose of.' "'I'm not worrying,' declared Markle importantly. No, said Jimmy Dale, two hundred and ten thousand, you said. Any special, uh, significance to the occasion, if the question's not impertinent? Birthday, wedding anniversary, or something like that? No, nothing like that, Markle grinned, winked secretively, and rubbed his hands together. I'm feeling good, that's all. I'm going to make the killing of my life tomorrow. Oh, said Jimmy Dale. Markle turned to Carruthers. "'I'll let you in on that, too, Carruthers, in a day or two, if you'll send a reporter around. Financial man, you know. It'll be worth your while. And now, how about this? What do you say to a little article and the photos next Sunday?' There was a slight hint of rising color in Carruthers' face. "'If you'll send them to the society editor, I have no doubt he'll be able to use them,' he said brusquely. Right, said Markle, and coughed, and patted Carruthers' shoulder patronizingly again. I'll just do that little thing. He picked up the necklace, dangled it till it flashed and flashed again under the light, then restored it very ostentatiously to its case, and the case to his pocket. Thanks awfully, Carruthers, he said as he rose from his chair. See you again, Dale. Good night. Carruthers glared at the door as it closed behind the man. "'Say it,' prodded Jimmy Dale sweetly. "'Don't feel restrained because you are a guest. I absolve you in advance.' "'Rotter!' said Carruthers. "'Well,' said Jimmy Dale softly, "'you see, Carruthers?' Carruthers' match crackled savagely as he lighted a cigar. "'Yes, I see,' he growled. But I don't see, you'll pardon my saying so, how vulgarity like that ever acquired membership in the St. James Club. Carruthers, said Jimmy Dale plaintively, you ought to know better than that. You know, to begin with, since it seems he has advertised with you that he runs some sort of brokerage business in Boston. He's taken a summer home up here on Long Island, and some misguided chap put him on the club's visitors list. His card will not be renewed. Sleek customer, isn't he? Trifle familiar. I was only introduced to him last night. Carruthers grunted, broke his burned match into pieces, and began to toss the pieces into an ashtray. Jimmy Dale became absorbed in an inspection of his hands, those wonderful hands with long, slim, tapering fingers, whose clean pink flesh masked a strength and power that was like to a steel vice. Jimmy Dale looked up. Going to print a nice little story for him about the costliest and most beautiful necklace in America? He inquired innocently. Carruthers scowled. No, he said bluntly, I am not. He'll read the news Argus a long time before he reads anything about that, Jimmy. But therein Carruthers was wrong. 
The news Argus carried the story of Markle's diamond necklace in three-inch caps in red ink on the front page in the next morning's edition. And Carruthers gloated over it because the morning news Argus was the only paper in New York that did. Carruthers was to hear more of Markle and Markle's necklace than he thought, though for the time being the subject dropped between the two men. It was still early, barely ten o'clock, when Carruthers left the club, and preferring to walk to the newspaper offices, refused Jimmy Dale's offer of his limousine. It was but five minutes later when Jimmy Dale, after chatting for a moment or two with those about in the lobby, in turn sought the coat-room, where Markle was being assisted into his coat. "'Getting home early, aren't you, Markle?' remarked Jimmy Dale pleasantly. "'Yes,' said Markle, and ran his fingers fussily, comb-fashion, through his whiskers. "'Quite a little run-out to my place, you know. And with you-know-what, I don't care to be out too late.' "'No, of course,' concurred Jimmy Dale, getting into his own coat. They walked out of the club together, and Markle climbed importantly into the tonneau of a big gray touring car. "'Ah, home, Peters,' he sniffed at his chauffeur, and then, with a grandiloquent wave of his hand to Jimmy Dale, "'Night, Dale!' Jimmy Dale smiled with his eyes, which were hidden by the brim of his bat. "'Good night, Markle,' he replied, and the smile crept curiously to the corners of his mouth as he watched the gray car disappear down the street. A limousine drew up, and Benson, Jimmy Dale's chauffeur, opened the door. "'Home, Mr. Dale?' he asked cheerily, touching his cap. "'Yes, Benson, home,' said Jimmy Dale absently, and stepped into the car. It was a luxurious car as everything that belonged to Jimmy Dale was luxurious. And he leaned back luxuriously on the cushions, extended his legs luxuriously to their full length, plunged his hands into his overcoat pockets. And then a change stole strangely slowly over Jimmy Dale. The sensitive fingers on his right hand in the pocket had touched, and now played delicately over a sealed envelope that they had found there, played over it as though indeed by the sense of touch alone they could read the contents, and he drew his body gradually erect. It was another of those mysterious missives from her. The texture of the paper was invariably the same, like this one. How had it come there? Collusion with the coat-boy at the club? That was hardly probable. Perhaps it had been there before he had entered the club for dinner. He remembered now that there had been several people passing, and that he had been jostled slightly in crossing the sidewalk. What, however, did it matter? It was there mysteriously, as scores of others had come to him mysteriously, with never a clue to her identity, to the identity of his, he smiled a little grimly, accomplice in crime. He took the envelope from his pocket and stared at it. His fingers had not been at fault. It was one of hers. The faint, elusive, exquisite fragrance of some rare perfume came to him as he held it. "'I'd give,' said Jimmy Dale wistfully to himself, "'I'd give everything I own to know who you are, and some day, please God, I will know.' Jimmy Dale tore the envelope very gently, as though the tearing almost were an act of desecration and extracted the letter from within. He began to read aloud hurriedly and in snatches. Dear Philanthropic Crook, Charlton Park Manor, Markle's house, is the second one from the gates on the right-hand side. Library leads off reception hall on left, door opposite staircase. Telephone in reception hall near vestibule entrance, left-hand side. Safe is one of your father's make, number 14321, closed closet behind the desk, probably will be kept in cash box, five servants, two men, three maids, quarters on top story, Markle and wife occupy room over library, French windows to dining room on opposite side of the house, opening on the lawn, get it to-night, Jimmy, tomorrow would be too late, dispose of it, See fit. 
Henry Wilbur, Marshall Building, Broadway, Fifth Story. Through the glass-paneled front of the car, Jimmy Dale could see his chauffeur's back, and the hand that held the letter dropped down to his side, and Jimmy Dale stared at his chauffeur's back. Then presently he read the letter again, as though committing it to memory now, and then, tearing the paper into tiny shreds, as he did with every one of her communications, he reached out of the window and allowed the little pieces to filter gradually from his hand. The gray seal, he smiled in his whimsical way, if it were ever known. He, Jimmy Dale, with his social standing, his wealth, his position, the gray seal, not a police official, not a secret service bureau, probably in the civilized world, but knew the name, not a man, woman, or child, certainly in this great city around him, but to whom it was as familiar as their own. Danger? Yes. A battle of wits? Yes. His against everybody's, even against Carruthers, his old college chum. For even as a reporter, before he had risen to the editorial desk, and even now that he had, Carruthers had been one of the keenest on the scent of the gray seal. Danger? Yes. But it was worth it, worth it a thousand times for the very lure of the danger itself, but worth it most of all for his association with her, who by some amazing means, verging indeed on the miraculous, came into touch with all these things, and supplied him with the data on which to work that always some wrong might be righted, or gladness come where there had been gloom before, or hope where there had been despair, that into some fellow human's heart should come a gleam of sunshine. Yes, in spite of the howls of the police, the virulent diatribes of the press, an angry public screaming for his arrest, conviction, and punishment, there were those, perhaps, who even on their bended knees at night asked God's blessing on the gray seal. Was it strange, then, after all, that the police, seeking a clue through motive, should have been driven to frenzy on every occasion in finding themselves forever confronted with what, from every angle they were able to view it, was quite a purposeless crime? On one point only they were right the old dogma, the old, old cry, old as the institution of police, older than that, older since time immemorial, cherchez la femme. Quite right, but also quite purposeless. Jimmy Dale's eyes grew wistful. He had been hunting for the woman in the case himself now for months and years, indefatigably, using every resource at his command, quite purposelessly. Jimmy Dale shrugged his shoulders. Why go over all this to-night? There were other things to do. She had come to him again, and this time with a matter that entailed more than ordinary difficulty, more than usual danger, that would tax his wits and his skill to the utmost, not only to succeed, but to get out of it himself with the whole skin. Mark, eh? Jimmy Dale leaned back in his seat, clasped his hands behind his head, and his eyes, half closed now, were studying Benson's back again through the plate-glass front. He was still sitting in that position as the car approached his residence on Riverside Drive, but as it came to a stop and Benson opened the door, it was a very alert Jimmy Dale that stepped to the sidewalk. Benson, he said crisply, I am going downtown again later on, but I shall drive myself, bring the touring car around, and leave it in front of the house. I'll run it into the garage when I get back. You need not wait up. Very good, sir, said Benson. In the hallway, Jason the butler, who had been butler to Jimmy Dale's father before him, took Jimmy Dale's hat and coat. It's a fine evening, Master Jim, said the privileged old man affectionately. Jimmy Dale took out his silver cigarette case, selected a cigarette, tapped it daintily on the cover of the case, and accepted the match from the old man hastily produced. "'Yes, Jason,' said Jimmy Dale, pleasantly facetious. "'It's a fine night, a glorious night, moon and stars and a balmy breeze, quite too fine, indeed, to remain indoors. 
In fact, you might lay out my gray ulster. I think I will go for a spin presently, when I have changed. Yes, sir, said Jason. Anything else, Master Jim? No, that's all, Jason. Don't sit up for me. You may go to bed now. Thank you, sir, said the old man. Jimmy Dale went upstairs, opened the door of his own particular den on the right of the landing, stepped inside, closed the door, switched on the light, and Jimmy Dale's debonair nonchalance dropped from him as a mask instantly. And it was another Jimmy Dale, the professional Jimmy Dale. End of Part 1, Chapter 3A